smaller perfect. is better okay. perfect both audio video is perfect we can start in a minute yeah okay whenever you're ready <laughs> These days, everybody is zooming. Seems like that's the system du jour. Yeah. People are calling that a Zoom watch now. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I'm here in New York, and uh, uh, my wife uh, is doing her uh, calls uh, on the business with Zoom. My kids are doing their school. Uh, work on Zoom. Zooming. Usually during the day, the dog zooms by too. <laughs> so everybody is zooming. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Okay, Anamalai, can you can you introduce uh, Sean and then we'll start? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm here in New York and uh, uh, my wife is doing her all the business with Zoom, my kids. And just make sure you mute others also. I hear a lot of echo, delayed echo, Venkatesh. Uh, yes, sir. Now you have to mute everybody and then start. Yes, sir. One, just a minute. Sir. Um, good evening, everybody, to our uh, lockdown lecture series. And today we have one of our greatest innovators in ophthalmology, Dr. Sean Yanchilev. He's the man behind Lucentis, Interoperative Abrometry, Cypass, and Amyloop, amongst other innovations. Currently, he's the professor of ophthalmology and the director of ophthalmic innovation and technology at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. And today we are here to listen to his talk on innovations and micro interventions on Myloop, MIX, robotics, and PhysoPrint microtherapeutics. Over to you, sir, for your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you, everybody, and Venkatesh for the invitation. When, when I got the invitation, um, I was, I was uh, uh, reflexly very happy uh, to revisit with you and uh, recall the, uh, the great hospitality um, when you guys welcomed me in India, Pondicherry, in Chennai, and I met the different Aravind uh, hospitals and physicians and patients um, several years ago. It was one of my most enjoyable visits. Uh, it was such a great hospitality. So when I got the call, uh, I was uh, uh, really inherently happy to revisit, even though virtually, unfortunately, uh, we have to do that. And I'm calling here from New York City, uh, where, as you know, we are in the middle, hopefully uh, turning, a, turning a curve now and a turn with that uh, um, uh, unfortunate pandemic. I know India is in the middle of it now and, and I really want to wish everybody uh, safety and, uh, and also the uh, opportunity uh, to revisit with their families and stay with their families and uh, stay safe. We're now fifth week here uh, in New York City and um, we're really seeing this uh, full tidal wave of uh, uh, pandemic cases, but it's also been a bit of an opportunity to uh, connect and reconnect with a lot of people uh, on the good side, uh, also to take a little pause professionally um, and uh, think of new ideas. So <laughs> we'll see. So I want to spend uh, a little bit of time uh, going over some of the technologies uh, that uh, I have developed over the last uh, decade or so. And um, uh, maybe some of them are already used uh, in India. I know about the MyLoop is, I'm not sure how much of intraoperative abrometry is used in India. So I wanna just highlight briefly the uh, clinical utility of that innovation. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about some of the new technologies uh, that we're working on, uh, which will hopefully be for the next uh, decade. Now, I feel a little lucky, um, and it's always good to be lucky in that business, because we know that 95% or more of the innovation 
of ideas, of ideation, does, does not see the light of day and does not touch patients. Most of the drugs in development, uh, as well as many of the ideas of many clinicians, and, and, and some of them have phenomenal ideas uh, that they want to bring to life. Unfortunately, they don't make it through the development purgatory, so to speak, uh, because uh, it's not that easy to bring a technology to life. It takes blood, sweat, and tears, and in these days, a lot of money. I was, uh, uh, when I finished my glaucoma fellowship, I worked with uh, Bob Sinski in his practice, and he obviously came up with the Sinski hook, among other things. And in those days, it was very easy. You know, you make a hook and you stick it in a person's eye, uh, and if it works, you use it. Uh, these days, you have FDA approval, uh, you in India, I know in 2018, there was a huge revamp of the medical device approval process. So we have a lot of uh, very, very um, uh, sophisticated pathway of innovation now that makes it harder for clinicians, unfortunately, uh, to innovate. Uh, at the same time, the technologies that come out are hopefully more validated uh, and safer. So when you look at the decade of the past decade of innovation, I started out with a couple of technologies that all uh, really made it through the FDA approval pathway. Uh, and Lucentis was, uh, uh, as we mentioned, one of them. I rarely talk about Lucentis now because obviously it's been around for so many years and there are a lot more eloquent uh, uh, people from the retina field. They talk about it clinically, uh, but we started that about uh, uh, almost 18 years ago. At Genentech, I headed all of the development there for uh, Lucentis and um, on the clinical side. And we designed the, the first uh, studies uh, that validated the pathway. And I'll tell you briefly about it. Subsequently, we uh, starting in residency, and this is a good point for residents. Uh, I invented uh, the uh, intraoperative vibrometry approach to cataract surgery, and I'll show you some, show you some of the utility. We have uh, here almost in every operating room in New York, Ohio, we have one of the aura systems and it's used now by more than a million cataract surgeries or maybe 2 million by now. And then the mix uh, space, which is really hot. And, uh, and I think we're starting to see a lot more traction there globally and uh, some of the superciliary stem technology. So for, uh, again, the good thing about being an eye doctor, as they call it, with an eye, meaning not with an EYE, but an eye, is that while you're an eye doctor, as an EYE doctor, right, when we see a patient, we are limited into, we're limited to the scale of our impact. We have tremendous impact seeing patients one-on-one, -on -one, doing surgeries one-on-one, -on -one, but we're limited to how many patients we can do. I think some people here see 50, 60 patients a day, and, and that's really humanly possible uh, as an EYE doctor. As an eye doctor with an eye, which means innovation doctor, the scale is tremendous. I mean, we see with Lucentis today, there's almost half a million patients in the US only uh, treated and more globally. Uh, this is an old number, 500,000 for intraoperative ergometry. Now it's more than a million and a half too. Probably I stopped updating it. Uh, we were planning with sign pass and superciliary stenting to do hundreds of thousands. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as innovation, even though it got FDA approved and started to be used greatly, we had uh, some uh, uh, setback with the material cell counts and I'll tell you about it. But I definitely think superciliary stenting is here to stay. And uh, uh, in fact, it may be coming back soon. So uh, in the retina space and Lucentis is, is obviously one of the uh, big innovations, uh, we transformed the field there. Right now, there are many other biologics. But when we started out, uh, and actually when I was at Harvard Medical School um, and working with Tonya Davis, and, uh, which was an offshoot of Judah Folkman's lab, uh, people did not know which diffusible factor was actually at play. There was the VEGFs, the FGFs, PDGFs, there were so many, it was almost like a manual list of 20, 30. Uh, and nobody knew that it was VEGF the driver. Uh, and so uh, this early science was really tremendous. Uh, it led to great innovation. And right now it's not just macular degeneration, but it's retinal vein occlusion. It's also diabetes. 
And, and then the pivotal studies, which really took the whole clinical validation almost 15 years, uh, but really transpired with some great, amazing data from Marina and Anker that showed that for the first time in macular degeneration, a patient has a different option than going blind, than losing vision. And you can see here how we showed with Lucentis, the lines, the orange and uh, the yellow, show that we can restore vision versus the control group losing vision. And right now there's a lot of studies that are done on that technology. Uh, again, I'm very happy that uh, my retina colleagues are using it a lot uh, and, uh, and it's really led to great innovation in the field. Again, it's not something that I'm singularly in any way responsible. There was a whole research team and a Genentech uh, through the years, uh, but ultimately as a clinician, I have the benefit of the fact that uh, unlike some of the researchers and the biotech uh, colleagues, who are not uh, ophthalmologists, uh, I enjoy the consequences of this innovation, meaning seeing it uh, in the clinic uh, used with uh, patients uh, I'm surrounded with. So now let's jump to intraoperative vibrometry. And I think this is something that hopefully uh, is uh, available now more in India and through the world. Uh, this is a, a research project I started out uh, originally in residency and then it became a, uh, in a real development uh, a project, uh, was uh, developed by a company, a venture-backed company called WaveTech. Uh, and again, as I say, that took a decade plus uh, and more than 60, 70 millions of dollars uh, to develop from venture money. So things start as an idea, but as I say to a lot of my colleagues, you know, idea is not enough, right? Uh, you know, tell me uh, how you're going to convert the idea into a solution and then tell me how you're going to convert the solution into a product that people pay for. The solution has to be meaningful and solve a problem. Uh, and then the product of that solution has to be meaningful that actually people will pay money for it uh, in order to solve that problem. And then in order to be a business, you have to have that product be scalable and become economically viable uh, uh, to become really a scalable business. So these are very difficult steps. Uh, and that's where most of the ideas fail because they cannot be converted from idea to solution uh, and clinical solution with clinical utility and then on be productized and then on be uh, converted into a business. So that was a, a data technology that succeeded and we're using it very often uh, in the OR. Uh, you can see how we started in 2003 and actually earlier, uh, you know, you can start things on a shoestring. And when I was uh, uh, in uh, India and visited with the Aravind, I was really impressed. I think uh, there were so many great ideas. People do so many things on a shoestring, not with millions of dollars. And actually you guys use them. Uh, so I, I, I really think there is a ton of innovation that is some, somewhat unrecognized globally and, and uh, we need to figure out how to uh, make it more relevant and, and bring it over here because there's some great techniques, they're great products uh, and, and uh, I wish there was more venture money in India too because I can see that the petri dish of that innovation is there in India. You guys have the ideas, uh, it's just that I think capital uh, and development expertise uh, and the venture side is where uh, it really helps those technologies grow up uh, and be uh, globally relevant. So we started out with intraoperative vibrometry um, and you can see initially we did not have a fancy machine that cost millions of dollars to develop. So what we, what we hypothesize is one, one that currently the way we do biometry for intraocular lens implantation is, is, uh, is obviously very effective, but it fails in certain cases, particularly post-refractive. And as the demands of IOL of uh, the outcomes arise, we, we were having some significant discrepancies between final outcome, uh, visual outcome uh, and, and the tropic uh, IOL power calculation. And we never use data intraoperatively, we always have been using preoperative biometry. You measure the axial length, you measure the corneal curvature, 
And then you use a formula from the 70s developed by the Russians and Fyodorov with many more permutations today, whether it's the Hages or the Hoffer or the SRK, but basically same old technology. And, uh, and then we calculate what the outcome is and we estimate it, but we never use biometry. And we had uh, intraoperatively, and we had that idea that, boy, wouldn't it be nice and how advantageous it is that when you take out the cataract and you remove the lens of the eye, you have that eye in a very privileged virgin state where you have the cornea and that's it. There is no interference by the old lens. You have a pure optical system. So if we do intraoperative autorefraction, and you can see here using the autorefractor, uh, basically, which was developed by the portable one in the clinic. That's how we started. So if we use the autorefractor, we can do an optical biopsy of the aphatic state and then really know real time what the deficit, the optical deficit of the eyes and calculate the eye wall power. So that's how we started. And then 10 years later, uh, $60 million later, we had that technology with intraoperative autonometry. And you can see uh, the intraoperative, the whole preoperative biometry field started out in 1967 with Fyodorov. And it has really evolved, but it's always been the same preoperative biometry. And uh, uh, we were just for the first time focusing now on doing intraoperative real-time biometry. And in fact, it was the first intraoperative biometry in ophthalmology because uh, right now people are putting a lot of OCT scans and other technology. We were turning the surgical uh, field in a cockpit like the pilots. Uh, but when we started out 20 years ago, uh, this was the first technology. And we did some beautiful validation studies here with uh, actually uh, uh, David Chang as well and Baskin Palmer. And we showed that we dramatically increased the predictability of, uh, uh, intro of the IOL uh, power. Uh, you can see the median absolute error in the study that we published in ophthalmology and uh, in the post LASIK case and uh, surgeon's best choice versus the Hages versus the Shamas. Uh, I mean, whatever uh, was really done in, uh, uh, in terms of the best possible alternative, uh, we really exceeded that with intraoperative autonometry because in these cases where you had prior refractive surgery is where the headaches start. We really don't know how to accurately calculate that and preoperative biometry fails uh, much more than in any other standard cases. And the beauty of intraoperative biometry is that it uses the uh, intraoperative biometry, uh, the refractive biometric uh, uh, biopsy of the aphatic state to really uh, do that. And I'll show you right now, here is a case where we actually use that to uh, calculate uh, the, and make sure that we have a decentration lens and use the uh, aura or the intraoperative biometry to make sure we've centered it. And you can see, you start out with a decentration of minus one and a half. And we now, uh, and you adjust the, uh, the lens uh, to the proper, what you think is the proper centered position. But in fact, the spherical equivalent went to minus 226, which you know on the table. So now more adjustment and manipulation is done, uh, even though it looks perfectly fine originally. And now we're getting where we've now reduced it minus two to minus 40 point four, 0 0.41. And then you can see, uh, in fact, with further manipulation, it goes to minus 0.48. Then you correct some of the astigmatism. So you can monitor this in real time on demand, what's happening to the refractive state, not only uh, in an aphatic state, but uh, uh, also in the pseudophagic state, uh, especially when it comes to touristy uh, and making sure you've nailed down your axis or when it comes to um, um, uh, centration and all that. So we're going with this technology and with intraoperative abonometry, we're really moving to a different game field. We're basically taking now our biometric high precision technology to the operating room. And you will see, if you haven't already, that the operating theater, as, uh, as, as I think you call it, will become a cockpit. 
you're going to have a lot more gadgets and a lot of things that we're going to be doing real time. So let me talk about a little bit switch gears about micro-interventional technology, because I think this is one of the things that is also uh, uh, gaining uh, in advance and gaining momentum in ophthalmology. And while in ophthalmology, we were ahead of the curve when it came to size many, many years ago with all of our VAMNES scissors and micro scissors and micro uh, hooks and, and, uh, and choppers and uh, other very fine instrumentation, we actually have lagged over the past 20 years, well behind cardiovascular, uh, neurovascular and interventional cardiology. Uh, we have really fallen behind on that level. And, uh, and I think what you will see is actually ophthalmology regaining that ground and really deploying now these micro-interventional technologies in our field as well. And it's starting out with some of the stent technology in glaucoma. Now in glaucoma, when I trained, we had few options, right? I mean, you have glaucoma, you wait until you have failed every man. And then we, um, we go for a tube or a trap. And I think probably in India more traps than tubes, but maybe now more tubes have gained more uh, popularity. But these were the options before 2000, uh, about the 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, then options started to increase. And uh, with micro-interventional approaches, now many things popped up. Uh, you know, canaloplasty was becoming popular. Uh, and now the stents are starting to show on the horizon, such as the eye stent. We work on the side pass. Uh, we have another trabecular stent, the hydras, uh, the Zen here. Um, and uh, again, uh, as that happens, this technology, some of them uh, come in and some of them fade away. That's the problem with innovation. Nothing is there to stay permanently. We know that canaloplasty right now is really not used very much. It's a uh, it's a technology that had demonstrated very good clinical outcomes in very few hands, uh, and uh, it was challenging to do. So that's one of the things with technology. It has to be available. It has to be democratic. Innovation has to be democratized, meaning it has to be for everybody. Uh, the technology cannot be reserved only for a few very skilled surgeons. Uh, but... The bottom line is that we're going in an age where micro-interventional technology is coming to ophthalmology. And it started out with glaucoma, strangely enough. Uh, I would have guessed it would start out with cataracts because we do a lot more cataracts than glaucoma. But it started out in glaucoma, which was a good coming for the field of glaucoma, which really uh, prior to this had seen very little innovation when it comes to medical devices. Uh, drugs took over. And I know that we've had great therapeutic advances when it comes to drug technologies and to uh, uh, medications uh, in the past 40 years, uh, but very little uh, had been before the mix space uh, in terms of uh, devices and uh, med tech. So the first stand is the eye stand, which came out and uh, again, it showed some efficacy. Uh, and when you look at the study that was done, uh, when we looked at the effect of uh, the eye stand, uh, you can see that at 12 months and 24 months, it showed uh, better IOP reduction when used in combination with cataract. And in the US, uh, all these stents are now approved primarily uh, with cataract uh, as an adjunct to cataract surgery. And you can see that obviously the uh, benefit of the control of IOP is better with the stand than without. But Again, it's not uh, overwhelming. And that's usually the case with first technologies. Even before Lucentis, we all had Macogen, if you remember, and Macogen uh, definitely left a lot to be desired. And then we have much more powerful therapeutics. Uh, but the more important part is that it was fairly safe. And that's what we needed in, uh, in uh, glaucoma. Uh, and when you look at the safety profile, of an eye stand is dramatically different, or any mix for that matter, it's dramatically different from the tubes and traps with much lower uh, rates of hypoxemy, of, uh, 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 of any of the uh, 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 
complications that we see with uh, non-mixed surgery. And you can see here, uh, let's see if the video will play, uh, uh, how this would come up. So you can see here the uh, uh, latest uh, stent, uh, eye stent technology where uh, it's the eye stent uh, to where you basically go and, and uh, position it right at the trabecular network and then it shoots the peg to go into the trabecular the network and into the Schlems canal and you put two of them. And uh, that's slightly different than uh, the Uh, the other video didn't play, unfortunately. I was stressing out the technology here. Let's see if we can go back. It's slightly different than the first generation, uh, I wanted to say, of. Uh, let me just go back. Okay. Versus the first generation of the technology where it looks like a snorkel and you come in and you really hook it into the Schlems canal, which I think gives you a little more security that, uh, and assurance that you are in the Schlems canal. Uh, and here is uh, how you position the first eye stand, uh, which I like better because it, it allows you more uh, tactile uh, confirmation. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, what we do with those, uh, with those stands is really create an opening in the, into the Schlenz canal, bypassing the resistance of the trabecular mesh uh, and uh, that leads to better outflow. And again, this is the first generation technology. Now we have uh, other technologies. The more recent one to be approved in the US is the Hydrus Microstent. It's an eight millimeter implant from nickel titanium, and it's designed to bypass the mesh work and dilate the Schlems canal several four hours of it. Uh, and you can see it here. Uh, it's much more hardware in the eye compared to the eye stand. So uh, it gives you a bigger purchase on the trabecular network. And you can see the implantation here when you go uh, and oppositionally to the Schlems canal uh, into the Schlems canal penetrate that and then you insert the scaffolding element, the hydrus. Uh, and, and again, what that does is not only creates an opening into the Schlems canal, but it actually creates a, a stretching and distension of the canal. And the outcomes of that uh, appear to be also compelling uh, as a mixed device. Uh, uh, again, you can see the results that were published. Uh, and uh, uh, there are now quite a few studies demonstrating that um, the baseline outflow resistance is reduced. Uh, when a stent like hydrus is used. And then the clinical studies confirm that we have better clinical outcomes when it comes to outflow. Uh, and here in the study between hydrus and FACO versus FACO that was published at 24 months, uh, uh, we're talking mild to moderate glaucoma here. So again, these are cases that are not the end stage. Uh, and when it comes to reduction of IOP and medication, we're seeing mild to moderate reduction which is better than the fake or not. So again, another stent with much better safety profile than tubes and traps. Uh, and, and again, addressing the uh, trabecular mesh work. Now, how about other areas? And we know the suprachoroidal space is very advantageous. And actually when it comes to therapeutic approaches with the drugs, the most powerful IOP lowering agents are using IOP lowering through the uveous pleural outflow, not through the trabecular one. So the prostaglandin analogs, uh, like uh, Latanoprost, for example, or Lumigan, they're great medications. They're probably the most powerful IOP lowering agents, and they work exclusively through the uveous pleural phase. So we then designed a stent called the Cypass, which was designed specifically to address uveous pleural or suprachoroidal outflow and it's a six millimeter center penetrated uh, stand that is uh, implanted into the supraciliary space. And in fact, it very much is a device that creates a controlled psychodialysis. Again, back to the future. If you go back a few decades, people used to create a, 
uh, cyclodialysis to control pressure in glaucoma. And one of the problems with cyclodialysis, besides the fact that it was very effective and worked really well, uh, was that it was in, uncontrolled. Uh, you, nobody had a, a controlled cyclodialysis and, no, and the cyclodialysis closed after a few months. There was no maintainer. Well, the Cypass was designed to solve both problems, to be controlled. It's always the same implant. Uh, and it's, I called it the third haptic uh, because it looked like a haptic. Uh, and uh, basically it was designed to maintain the outflow facility and uh, to maintain the uh, uh, superciliary space open. And you can see here a video of how elegant the procedure is. You can go, you can go through a one millimeter incision uh, and it really is easier to implant than uh, anything in the trabecular mesh because it's much easier to find the superciliary space by just going above the iris. You don't have to thread a needle into a Schlem's canal, but basically once you're on top of the uh, iris, you can easily create a, uh, um, a superciliary cleft uh, and detach the ciliary body uh, and implant it. And you will see it's a few minutes to implant it uh, you go right above the iris root. The uh, applier is a blunt tip, so it doesn't cut the tissue. It simply bluntly dissects uh, the superciliary space into the superciliary space. Now you go a little higher than you have to, but uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, I hope that you guys can hear me. Okay, I still got a point here from Bank uh, Let's see if we can. One second. Hopefully, you guys can hear me. Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Oh, okay, good. Uh, so you can see the implant now is uh, uh, about five millimeters or more in the superciliary space, and now it creates that ciliary cleft and detachment. And, uh, and it showed some very compelling clinical outcomes. Uh, actually, as a, a mixed device uh, with uh, a significant IOP lowering over the control group for uh, FACO alone. Uh, but uh, in the post marketing period, after we approved it, and this is a, the stand that was uh, uh, here distributed in, uh, uh, in the US by uh, Alcom. Uh, again, the adverse event profile from, from the PMA and from the uh, FDA study uh, was, uh, uh, was very, looked like that the safety and risk was uh, justified. It was uh, much better than a tube and trap, just like the other mixed devices. Uh, it did have uh, some cases, mild cases of uh, uh, maculopathy and cystoid edema that resolved uh, and improved. So uh, something that basically demonstrated slightly more IOP lowering and also a little bit more uh, uh, potential uh, uh, adverse events uh, compared to some of the trabecular stents. But more importantly, uh, uh, it, it really created a very compelling approach uh, to creating IOP lowering or achieving IOP lowering uh, with a suprachoroidal uh, outflow enhancement. Uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, in the five-year follow-up, uh, it became evident that some patients started to lose uh, and continue to lose endothelial cell. And uh, the endothelial cell loss uh, really manifested uh, preferentially into the Cypass group uh, after the third year. And it was mainly uh, or exclusively limited to patients where the implant was more anteriorized, meaning it wasn't implanted as deep as it should have been. If it's implanted uh, to the proper depth, there was no excess in the bill of cell loss, but when uh, uh, part of it was more anterior, it led to uh, a progressive uh, loss and attrition of endothelium. Uh, and uh, that's when uh, the uh, implant was withdrawn uh, and, and uh, further work is done to really understand and solve that problem. But again, this is something that really uh, will teach us a lesson, all of us, that sometimes uh, uh, events in some technologies and the true risk benefit is understood, uh, not even a year or two out, it may be five years out. And, and again, there is a lot of other hardware-driven 
mixed devices that we'll see. Um, and uh, for some of them, we really don't know what a four or five year and they'll sell losses. And something for us to watch for uh, is really to pressure test every innovation and make sure that it's not only safe in the near term, uh, and, and unfortunately the near term is still pretty long, one or two years, uh, but it's also safe in the long term uh, as it comes to uh, uh, industrial cell loss, uh, which may be visible and, and something that we see three or four or five years out rather than one or two years. So innovation is not always linear and straightforward. So um, there is also another implant that we have in the US uh, for MIGS, uh, and uh, uh, this is the Zenglocoma. Uh, uh, a treatment system. Uh, it creates an outflow transclerary. So this is ab internal transcleral uh, uh, implant. And we're just starting to get experience with that. Um, and, uh, and it basically creates an ab internal a perforation uh, and a conduit through the sclera. Um, but again, this is more done uh, in the context of uh, more advanced glaucoma. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, because it involves transcleral perforation, uh, it does have higher rates uh, of some of the complications that we see with, uh, uh, with uh, traditional conventional glaucoma surgeries. Uh, yet still better, more elegant procedure. Uh, and again, something that uh, as we advance, all of these stents will be able to solve the problem of um, of safety and efficacy and create an alternative uh, because tubes and traps, uh, again, where we were 20 years ago, we need to move into a better place. Uh, these technologies are difficult uh, to implant and uh, they're not relevant even to the developing world uh, because patients uh, cannot be monitored so aggressively. Um, and we need to come up with better, more uh, streamlined treatment for glaucoma as we have for cataract and a follow-up that's much easier. Uh, and again, now we're starting to see a lot of other devices on the space here in, uh, in, in uh, the US. We have the Kahoot Dual Blade, uh, which creates a goniotomy, it's basically a goniotomy knife. Uh, and then Site Sciences, which is making a, uh, uh, a discal kind of loss to me, uh, ab internal. And uh, uh, they're showing similar uh, IOP lowering efficacy to what we have with some of the stents. So I think that in some time soon, we're going to see the battle of the clones, as they call it, the battle of the stents versus the non implantable mix. Um, and you will see a lot more interventional technologies in the mix space that are not implants. Uh, partially for the reason that we saw with SIPAS, that implants are hardware inside the eye. And every time you have to have hardware inside the eye, you have some potential risk of, um, of um, complications long term. So we spoke about interventional technology and how we're, we're, this whole field of mixed technology is opening up. And I think it's going to be here to stay and it's going to be exciting. And we will have to see which, which one becomes the most relevant technology to stay. And, um, and just like uh, other innovations, they started out on the low end and then they moved into the high end. Uh, all that mix is starting out in the mild to moderate glaucoma. And, and I can totally appreciate how in India, uh, you may you might counterpoint, well, that's not so relevant to us because we have more advanced glaucoma. But I think that with some time, all these mix interventions will actually be able to one day tackle the most severe of cases or some combination of those mix where you can put a stent in the supraciliary space, a stent in the trabecular space, you do cataract surgery, so you have almost a triple procedure already uh, for IOP lowering. Well, where is microinterventional going next? Well, let's talk about cataract surgery. And cataract surgery is ready for disruption. Uh, it's been 50 years since FACO was uh, uh, discovered and, and developed here in New York City by Kelman. And we celebrated at ASCRS the 50th anniversary of FACO. It's been a phenomenal technology. We know that cataracts started with the intra cap and then extra cap. 
and uh, manual extra cap uh, has been tremendous. And the small incision extra cap that is done so beautifully in uh, in India, uh, and then Peiko really started settling and uh, and taking over, particularly here. Uh, Ninety percent of cases are now Peiko. Uh, we obviously advanced with uh, additional uh, uh, laser uh, based uh, uh, augmentation of the Peiko with fem to second uh, cataract surgery, and that has been tremendous. But if we look at fake emulsification today and 50 years ago, it has really changed not that much. Uh, here is the first Cavitron machine and here is the machine today. It looks a little more beautiful, uh, elegant, but let's look at the probe. This is the fake probe of 50 years ago, the 9,000 model piezoelectric ultrasound pump, pump piece. And yeah, it's not as shiny, but if you look at it, it's about the same as the infinity of today. So we've improved, obviously. Uh, FACO has become better and better, but we've also reached a plateau of the technology. The technology has really matured. And where can we go next? And where are the challenges? Well, you always, the way you think about where to go next is say, where are the challenges today? Well, the challenges are that with FACO or even with FAMTO, we can we deliver energy in the eye. Energy leads to endothelial cell loss, and it's particularly high with higher cataract rate. Number two, where FACO is also challenged is where we talk about hard cataracts. And we know it's very easy to do a FACO on a, a 2020 or 2040 uh, Manhattan or uh, uh, Hollywood cataract but it's very different type of skill and a different cataract when you have a hypermature cataract or you have a domestic cataract. We know that the learning curve of FACO is very difficult. And when we train surgeons globally, that is not a trivial procedure. And then we know that FACO has capital expense and is associated with significant complexity. So these are all challenges. And we know, uh, I don't need to uh, uh, spend too much time on that, but we know that with higher grade, we deliver more energy, we have more endothelial cell loss. Um, and again, plenty of studies demonstrating that. We also know that FACO hasn't really made a dent when it comes to cataract blindness. We've solved so many problems in the world when, it, when we talk about infant mortality, maternal mortality, some of the infections, but cataract related blindness is on the rise and it hasn't been uh, so and we, I have done uh, a lot of uh, missionary work to Ethiopia, Africa, to Latin America, and there is a sea world, an ocean of cataracts. And probably in India, you solve that problem to the best that I've seen. But again, it's a very, very big problem and it hasn't been solved, partially because paper technology has not been easy to adopt and implement. And so what is true north? If you were to develop the next generation or the next cataract technology, what is true north? What would you want on your wish list, so to speak? Well, I would want minimum to zero energy in the eye. So I want to do the fragmentation without any energy. I would want the fragmentation to be cataract grade independent. I would like to be able to cut a very brunescent cataract as easy as I would cut a mild cataract. I would like it to be disposable instrumentation single use without infection. Uh, and I don't want to increase my time and complexity of cataract surgery. And I want it to be trainable and scalable. So all these things are on my wish list. So when we, with the engineer, sat down to think about how can we fragment the lens differently than just paper energy, we thought of that the best way to do that is to mechanical zero energy endocapsular fragmentation. And how would that work? Well we actually thought that the examples can be drawn from two places. One of them is from the interventional field uh, in cardio, cardiac intervention and interventional radiology where they use a lot of thin filaments and super elastic filaments which can allow you to do that. And the other one is from cheese cutting. And uh, when you eat uh, some cheese with your wine and it's a strong, very hard cheese, how do they cut cheese? They don't cut cheese with FACO, they cut cheese with wires. So we really looked at the wire and filament technology using the interventions of today, which means nitinol, 
uh, nickel titanium, the same material that's used in a lot of the stands. Why? Why do we have to use that? Because, uh, because this material is super elastic and this material has to be memory shape. So we designed the Milo, which is a super elastic thin filament. It expands very easily from 12 millimeters to less than one, can go through a one and a half two millimeter incision. It can expand, it travels around uh, on the surface of the lens. It expands to a pre-shaped memory shape form, then wraps around into the endothelial interface, into the uh, endocapsular interface between the uh, bag and the uh, cataract. And then it cinches the cataract and cuts it. So in the process, uh, literally zero, zero uh, energy in the eye, no heat participation. And you can see how we actually have the bi-loop tube where you can do two filaments, uh, where they would expand. And, uh, and as you can see, they expand very lightly on top of the lens, uh, and then they wrap around the lens and then they cut it. So again, very different way of doing fragmentation. And it's very different because compared to chopping, where you do the chopping of the cataract inside out, you basically chop it and stretch it, you actually cut here outside in. Once it goes into the plane, it literally cuts the lens out in by cinching it, which is very advantageous because it doesn't put a lot of stress on the capsule. And you can see here, the cut on the Miyagi view, how uh, little stress there is on the capsule when you look from uh, below, because the, the filament goes around and it's shaped to cut the lens rather than stretch the capsule. And then it's able to cut the lens and it pretty much cuts any type of uh, cataract, whether it's mild or wild. Uh, and even if you put your finger, it's gonna cut it because this is nitrogen you know, alloy. So that's how we started out with endocapsular fragmentation and uh, with the MyLoop technology, which is actually the first time that we're able to cut centrip uh, centripetally versus centrifugally. Every time we chop, we chop the lens centrifugally, meaning from inside out. Every time we cut with the MyLoop, we fragment it centripetally from outside in, which really eliminates the stress on the zonules. And uh, there is a study coming out uh, that uh, uh, was done, uh, it's a phenomenal study. It basically showed that you improve refractive outcomes dramatically with the MyLoop uh, versus without. And how is that possible? The MyLoop is not a uh, uh, refractive device like the Aura. Well, the reason it's possible is because of centripetal versus centrifugal cutting. When you cut with the MyLoop, you don't stretch the zonules, which means you don't make the back floppy and subclinically distort and break zonules, which really controls the effective lens position much better. So that paper is coming out. It's really amazing that we can detect much better, uh, much better uh, um, uh, uh, refractive outcome after my look uh, based on improved stability of the capsular complex and improve stability of the ELT. So you can see here the carousel technique where you can do multiple cuts by rotating the lens inside. So here it is, you do one cut and then you re-expand. Uh, and once you re-expand, you rotate the lens within the my look. This is Toby Tyson doing the carousel technique. Then you chop again. And you know, sometimes you cut twice or three times, uh, that's fine. But, uh, you know, you have to be careful not to displace or pull outside the eye. You have to stay centered. And like every device, uh, it has its learning curve. Uh, but again, we have seen that most surgeons after their fifth or sixth days uh, are becoming very proficient with that. So what have we done here? We've done a mechanical centripetal endocapsular fragmentation without using any lens, any power. Now we're going currently with the FACO to then remove the segments and it's very easy because not only are they cut fully but they're also released from the capsule.
Okay. And um, and that's uh, yeah, that's how this works. And uh, we can we can really do this with very dense cataracts or with mild cataracts. And we've shown that in the hands of very experienced faithful surgeons, we can reduce for the same if we randomize cases, we can reduce the energy use for the faithful by 53%. That's dramatic. So if you give a very experienced faithful surgeon the myelope and they do the pre-fragmentation with the myelope and then just go with the faithful to remove the uh, segment, you use 53% less power for your faithful and, and, and obviously that would be related to better corneal health uh, afterwards. So uh, again, this is, this is very uh, encouraging. And again, there were some good accolades of the technology. The part that you haven't seen yet is the second device, the MyPort. So MyLoop is now in the hands and the company was sold to Zeiss. Uh, and I think they're introducing it globally. But the part that you haven't seen is the MyPort. So MyPort is basically the second pen that once you have fragmented the lens with the MyLoop, you then extract the lens pieces with this small pen. Here is your pedal. The pedal is that the green button on the top. So no more pedal, no more capital equipment. Everything will be in a single pen that does not connect to a box. That is your fake tip, so to speak, but without the fake tip, and it uses mechanical cold agitation for the technology. And again, I cannot talk much more about this, but the, what we're trying to do is we have one step with the MyLoop, which fragments the lens, and then you have the MyPort, or however that will be named, which will go in and extract it, and you're doing that with two pen-like devices. So this will be the future, hopefully, and uh, right now this technology that we started is really uh, developed and brought uh, to life through uh, Zeiss and, uh, and the uh, engineers that we started this innovation with. And hopefully you're gonna have one my kit. In your my kit, will have the MyLoop pen and the MyPort pen, and that's it. Wouldn't that be great? So um, what I also wanted to mention is other things that I'm working on. Again, interventional is not gonna stop with, uh, with, the, uh, with the MyLoop and the MIGS. We also have other things. And I think in India, people are using Zeptu. Uh, I wanted to mention that technology. It's not something that I've been involved in, but again, it's another example of interventional technology coming to help us with more predictable capsulotomy. What we're working here on, uh, uh, at New York Eye uh, is uh, actually we're bringing in robotics and will be the third center in the world here to bring in a, a system called the Precise. The robotics is a phenomenal new direction in surgery. And again, ophthalmology is a little behind the curve. Well, this is the first uh, clinically validated system that has actual CMR in ophthalmology with Precise and I'm working closely with the company. This is the actual device that allows you to do high precision uh, uh, surgical intervention, either retina or cataract. Again, the best surgeon has a precision of about 100 microns. This will have a precision of five microns. We're gonna, you can cannulate veins, you can do things that we could never do before. And it's very exciting. Exciting. Here you can see that uh, uh, a video of how you can do subretinal injection. One of the problems with subretinal injection is that you cannot always go into the subretina and you waste a lot of these new, very expensive gene therapy drugs. And here you can see, you can monitor it live with OCT and you can advance it micron by micron to really get exactly where you need to be in the subretinal space and deliver uh, the injection and monitor. So you see what we're doing. We're combining biometry. We're combining visualization in the OR in a way we have it with OCT. At the same time, we're increasing the precision with robotics. So. For everybody who will be practicing in the next 20 years, this will be good times and a lot of excitement uh, will, will be um, uh, in the field with that, with that uh, convergence of imaging technology that will all come together and robotics. And New York Pioneer will, bring the, will be the third center uh, bringing that robotic system, actually to be the first clinical grade robotic system in the US that we're bringing here as we start the robotics uh, center of innovation. Uh, so I think we may probably be good. 
and uh, I'll just maybe stop here. Uh, I was going to cover a little bit on microtherapeutics and smart therapeutics, which is another field, but that could be some other time we can talk about it. Again, all I wanted to say is ophthalmology is going micro, smaller is better. We've known that we just need to get to, uh, we need to get to business and really develop smarter, finer uh, micro uh, devices and micro therapeutics uh, so that we can deliver better care. And with that, I'll just pass it on to you guys. So th thank you very much, sir. Um, we will take questions now. And I have a question for you, sir. Like, um, suppose a lot of people have lots of ideas. Now, how do you take it to the next level? So for example, Lucentis, uh, you'll have an idea that it acts against VEGF. Now, how did it become a molecule? Can you explain it in short? Yeah, so I think that when it comes to therapeutics, it's a little bit harder than devices to some degree because you do need a whole team of uh, uh, people who are designing those antibodies and those chemical entities. Um, again, uh, when I mentioned Sinsky before, it was interesting. He's a preceptor of mine, great clinician, and it was easy to develop the Sinsky hook. You know, one person can do it. Today, you have to be a team. I, I don't know how to design the actual antibody, but I can look at the antibody science and give clinical guidance to uh, uh, biotechnology experts who can design it. So uh, it takes a lot of time. It takes team and it takes capital. And that is the issue. You cannot do a lot of this uh, either alone or you sometimes, unfortunately, you cannot do it in between 20 cases. You have to prioritize it. And if you want to take the idea to a solution, to a product, you have to really invest time. For example, for me, I see patients only one day a week and the rest of the time I'm focusing on innovations and I'm developing new technology because I personally like to be a lot more an eye doctor with an eye than an eye doctor with an EYE because through some of these innovations, I can touch a lot more patients. And what about these devices? Uh, are these uh, mostly 3D printed first and uh, tested on uh, animal eyes? So the 3D printing, um, again, 3D printing is just another way to get things a little bit faster. We're actually working on some new devices that I haven't spoken here, but in the old days, uh, what you would do is you have to create a mode uh, for some of these devices. If they're mechanical, uh, the molding process takes time. It takes thousands of dollars and you know, something that would take normally two months and you know, $50,000 for a mode for some parts. Right now, 3D printing can come to play and um, it can shorten that interval from doing, you know, maybe instead of doing two months, maybe a week or two or less. So 3D printing is there. It's actually very exciting because you can do things faster, but it doesn't solve the ultimate problem of how do you do the whole technology solution and how do you validate it? Because people need clinical outcomes. And so even if you come up with a new stand, you can make it, uh, you can design it, but that's only the beginning. The actual engineering design is only the beginning. Then you have to validate it, improve it, and iterate it multiple times. Uh, and yes, 3D printing actually helps us get there faster. I'm working on a, on a superciliary stand technology now where we were able to do what normally would take two or three years in about four to five months. So that's exciting. That compresses the time. Uh, but I still require a team. I still require funding. I still require the same basic elements, even with the 3D printing. There's no way around it. Okay. There are a few questions in the chat section. So Go ahead. Uh, one such question is, so what are the chances of damage to the posterior capsule with the my loop? And what happens if it entangles the iris or the capsule? Is it, can it be released safely? Yeah, so um, when we did the study originally, we actually were worried about the capsule a lot because obviously you're, you're going where no one has gone before. We're inserting hardware, we're inserting a filament in that capsular plane. Uh, and, and of course, initially we were thinking, we're gonna try this and probably will fail and we'll have to kill the technology because one of the biggest risks is, is, is you're gonna be uh, really um, um, uh, uh, breaking capsule. 
what turned out to be when we tested it in cadaver eyes and in cadaver eyes, you know, the capsule is even more fragile. In cadaver eyes, when we did the test, we absolutely had no, no um, uh, capsular tears. And then when we did the study in, uh, in humans in, uh, in Latin America, we found very low rate. In fact, FACO was causing more tears than, uh, than um, the MyLoop. And that is because the MyLoop is designed to slide within in the capsular plane, not by pushing the capsule, but, but actually hugging the lens. And it causes centripetal pressure rather than, than centrifugal. Uh, and, and with the chopping going in out versus out in, in the Maya loop, uh, it's actually uh, more uh, tender on the capsule uh, than the chopping. Now, um, we've been using the Maya loop here. Obviously, you can tear a capsule with, I mean, you stick anything in the eye, you can cause damage. Um, and uh, I, I uh, haven't seen exactly uh, uh, every study or if there have been additional studies that have come out after our original study, but we're going to learn a lot more. I'm sure there's going to be, uh, just like any instrumentation in the eye, there could be cases where you do have uh, tearing, but we didn't see any uh, uh, tear uh, over what we see with FACO. And again, uh, it does require to learn the technology and be very, very careful when you use it. Uh, it looks very easy. And like everything else, we've designed it to be usable, to be easy, but it's non-trivial. There are little pearls and little uh, approaches that you have to implement and learn. And don't learn, again, on your hardest cases, just like FACO. Don't start FACO on the Brunessen cataract. Uh, start it on a milder case, just so that you're comfortable with the device and then advance. So, so yes, we've actually been very surprised that the MyLoop does not cause uh, uh, any uh, uh, tension and uh, untoward effects on the capsule. Uh, and partially that's because we're using super slick and thin filament with the nitinol, which is memory shape uh, in the appropriate configuration for that. Yes, another question is, uh, who will take responsibility in case of a complication due to a robotic error in case of robotic surgeries? <laughs> so I try to say, we're, we're, we're again, let's be clear, robots are not doing the surgeries. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, everybody now is, is very careful to say, this is not robotic surgery, this is robot-assisted surgery. So we, the surgeon is doing the surgery and the robot is just allowing you to, uh, to, to do a better procedure. Now, uh, I think the robotic part is an extension to you, just like the FACO is an extension to us. Uh, we cannot do FACO with our finger, right? We need the FACO machine. We cannot uh, stabilize our tremor and, and improve our precision from 100 microns to five microns. We cannot do it. So we're using these tools. So robotic surgery, you know, I think is a bit of a misnomer. It's no robotic in terms of, uh, 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 you know, who's doing the surgery. We're basically using additional tools for tremor stabilization, for high precision optimization. And it's, it, it's a little bit unfairly, I think the semantic uh, definition of calling it robotic, I think is just uh, another technology that helps us be more precise. Uh, and so I definitely don't see any time soon uh, having a robotic, uh, fully automated, same independent uh, cataract surgery or anything else. So uh, unfortunately, guys, we will be stuck with the complications and the surgeon will have to manage them. <laughs> no way around it. Okay. And is 3D printing possible for very small devices uh, and uh, or are only large models possible? Uh -huh. So good question. Uh, one of the challenges I had with my next technology, which I mentioned, is we had to 3D print something really small. And when you get there, the challenges begin. I think uh, everything is great when you draw it on a napkin. But if you go down the scale to where we are in ophthalmology and you're looking at things that are 50, 100 micron, 3D printing is not there yet. Um, so... I think it will be there. I think we'll be able, and there are some very high precision systems that are coming out online now. But if you're gonna 3D print something, 
with some features that are below 50 microns or 100 microns. I'm not saying you may not be able to do it. You may find a place that may, but we're still in the uh, anecdotal artistic stages where you have to really depend on, on, on where you're doing it and it's not coming off the shelf. So uh, things are getting better, guys, but I, I still think as of now, and, and I've just recently uh, completed a project where we're dealing with that, it's not that easy to 3D print at this small scale, hopefully soon. And, and I'm actually confident there will be very high resolution 3D printing for us soon. So the next one is, can uh, Milo be done in patients uh, with mature cataracts? Yeah, actually we, we started out with those and I have some great videos and I'm sure uh, we're now doing a collaboration with the Aravind and uh, in fact, we're preparing to review some initial data uh, because we've uh, given the my loop for uh, clinical investigation. I think that it's really useful for the, high, for the very high grade cataracts and brunescent cataracts. It cuts everything. Now you have to be, as I say, don't go directly to that right off the bat because you have to be uh, a little bit experienced to know how to do it, but it's beautiful for those cataracts because it literally cuts right through uh, and it's independent of cataract grade. Uh, you have to be a little bit more careful to stabilize the nucleus and to make sure that uh, as, you, as you cinch it and cut it, uh, it does not displace the cataract forward. So you need to do counter pressure with the second instrument. But again, things that are easy, you just have to uh, know the technique. And that's where it helps the most. As I said, in the hard cases, it cuts down energy by almost 40, 50% in experienced phaco cams, in a very experienced phaco surgery. So this is where it makes a uh, beginner or, or uh, average phaco surgeon so much easier, so much better because uh, it prepares the lens, it releases, it does a micro dissection. In addition to the hydro dissection, it removes the lens and the material. INA is very easy because it releases the cortex uh, and at the same time cuts your full thickness cuts of the uh, nucleus. So it, it's really great, not only for the hard ones, but for the soft ones, because you know that sometimes for the soft ones, you cannot achieve a full thickness cut. It's hard to crack it and to create a propagation crack. So I think the my loop in that aspect is great because it cuts through everything. Another question by Dr. John, uh, can Milo be used after prolapsing the nucleus into the anterior chamber? Uh, you could, you could. I don't know why you would, but you could. Uh, I mean, I try to, I try, when I do the Maya loop, I, I do it endocapsularly because it's designed for that. Uh, if you do it in the anterior chamber, be careful with the endothelium. And then uh, when I cut, I actually let the pieces prolapse a little bit. So once you cut it, uh, you know, we you, sometimes we're afraid that something prolapses in the AC. Well, actually, I like that because when I cut it and I don't do much counter pressure, the cut happens and, uh, and you have to be careful for the capsule, but it's okay for things to kind of a tilt and a little prolapse in the AC. It makes it so much easier than to go and take them out with the uh, uh, you know, the, the phaco. So uh, again, a little prolapse is good, but I don't know why you would do that. Uh, but if you do, be careful to make sure that, uh, you know, you, you stay clear of the iris and the endothelium. Okay. And uh, in one of the slides, I did see that uh, eye stent is, uh, is a metallic instrument. So MRI is uh, sort of contraindicated. So is it true? Yeah, I think it's MRI compatible, so, but you, you have to do a reduced MRI settings. So um, uh, it, it's, it's partially MRI safe, so you have to use, uh, you have to tell the uh, radiologist to use the uh, specific settings. So you can have an MRI, but you have to be uh, at the reduced level. Okay. That Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, wonderful session. And you, uh, that's it with the questions. And if anybody has any oral questions, they can unmute their mics and ask.
Well, I, all I want to say is that uh, I really hope to see a lot more innovation. Dr. Sean? Dr. Sean? I think uh, there's some issue with your audio. Uh, Namalai? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think um, mm. he's not muted, but um, his audio is not reaching us. Sean, can you hear us? Uh, yes, sir. I can hear you. Uh, Dr. Yanchalo is not uh, audible. His video is also apparently paused. Okay, I think there should be some technical issue. Anamala, I think we should close the session. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Sean, again uh, for the excellent talk. and. Uh, uh, so many interesting um, innovations, and we are looking forward for the my port and the my kit. Like how you said, honey, we don't know who has shrunk the Feco machine, but we know that it's Sean who has shrunk the Feco machine into a probe now. How it is going to go in the future, we have to wait and see. But it's so interesting. Some of some of your innovations have been real game changers. Thank you again. Have a good day. Thank you, sir.